everyone welcome to this week's youtube video now i didn't plan on doing any more videos around power weapons but i did have a request from someone in the comments on a previous video asking how do you paint power weapons with an airbrush now you guys know that i don't really do a huge amount of airbrushing videos on this channel because ultimately i prefer painting with a paintbrush it's just the way that i enjoy painting more but if people ask for it then i'll make it happen so as always, I hope this video is helpful. If you've got any questions, please do let me know in the comments below. Worth noting, this video, the way that I've done it, is designed for people who are new to airbrushing, who don't potentially have the greatest equipment, also don't potentially have the greatest trigger control. So if that's for you, then great. If you want to support the channel, as always, feel free to check out the links below for my Patreon or more in-depth video tutorials for one-to-one -one tuition, or do you know what, if you just want to support me, because let's be perfectly honest, I need all the help that I can get. <laughs> so um, without further ado, here we go. So before we start this video, I wanted to go over a couple of points which are going to be helpful throughout this video. So the first thing is, that I'm gonna make a point here, this is supposed to be a beginner's video to help with beginners who are quite new to airbrushing to try and get a result. So airbrushing is, a, airbrushing is a finesse tool. Now with this particular one, I'm making a point of using what is my workhorse. This is a, a fairly decent entry level airbrush. This is a Badger Patriot 105. And it's also, I've made a point of leaving it so it's not exactly as clean as it should be. There's paint clogged. Um, it needs a really good deep clean. This is working off the assumption that a lot of people are possibly still going to get be getting used to the fact that their airbrushes are not going to be as maintained as they should be because when you're first starting out, it can be quite difficult to learn how to clean them and everything. So the airbrush that I'm gonna be using is not in the best of condition at this point. It needs a strip down and a deep clean. The other thing is, is the Badger Patriot is not a, um, it's not a really precise airbrush unless you get a smaller needle. So I'll put the needle size and, and everything in the description below. Now, the main thing that I wanted to go over is in this video, I'm going to reference locking in the airbrush. Now, what I mean by that is locking in your trigger position. So some airbrushes have an adjuster at the back where they stop you from pulling your trigger all the way backwards. But what I'm talking, and you can use that, but what I'm talking about in this video is the simple fact of getting your trigger in the position where it's blowing enough air and enough paint out. So we all know you push your trigger down, this controls the amount of air that comes out the end, the amount of pressure that comes out the end, and you pull your trigger back, and that controls the amount of paint that comes out as well. So between the two, that controls how much pressure that we have coming out, how much paint we have coming out, and the sort of result that we're gonna get. You very, very rarely wanna pull that trigger all the way back. So what I mean by locking in, is locking in is getting our airbrush into the point where we've pushed the trigger down enough and pulled the trigger back enough to get enough paint out. So this is where I'm talking about locking in the sweet spot for the amount of paint coming out of the airbrush and the amount of pressure coming out of the airbrush. So this is the sweet spot. And the idea with this is, is if we can find this sweet spot, it makes it much easier. But when we're new to airbrushing, it's very difficult to get the sweet spot that you're looking for. So if we find it before we start airbrushing, that will make life a lot easier. First thing that we're going to talk about is paint consistency. So in this case, I'm using Vallejo Game Air Paints uh, and Vallejo Model Air Paints. So my general rule when I'm thinning down my paints for airbrushing is I'm going to use equal amounts of paint, airbrush Vallejo Airbrush Flow Improver and Vallejo Airbrush Water. So this is the water you can see adding in. And then I'm going to add Vallejo Airbrush Flow Impro Improver. The water thins the paint down so it doesn't clog up. The flow improver helps reduce the speckling. I know a lot of people are not necessarily a believer in this stuff. Personally, it's always worked well for me and I so incredibly rarely have any issues with my airbrush. So this is just the way I do it. It's not necessarily the right way. It's not necessarily the only way, but it has worked for me. And this is the sort of consistency that I'm personally looking for. So the paint is really thin, it is really transparent. Although airbrushing speeds up your painting, it is very much, as I said at the beginning, it's a finesse tool, you still want to do it slowly. You want to be building up this paint 
in very slow in very slow layers. Now, if you're anything like me, when you were first starting out, trigger control was incredibly difficult. Uh, it's, it takes a lot of precision and a lot of practice, and I really struggled to get that sweet spot. So earlier, when I turned around and said, we find that sweet spot before we start painting, this is where it begins. So if you look when I'm airbrushing, you'll find that my glove is moving. I'm painting on my glove. This is one of the reasons why I like black gloves, because I find it easier to see the paint so what i will do although i'm not going to lie if you watch some of my other videos i don't do this anymore this was very much something that i did when i started out but what i actually do is i find my sweet spot on my trigger and i get the paint so it's coming out of the airbrush and i spray onto my glove not the model there's a couple of reasons for this but the idea is i start spraying on my glove and then while that paint is coming out I'll move my airbrush so I start spraying the model. And the reason for this is, is firstly, it allows me to get absolute control over the airbrush and lock my trigger position in off of the model, which means if I make a mistake, which especially if you're new to airbrushing, you probably will, that mistake happens off the model and doesn't ruin it. And you can just stop and try again, which is really important. The other thing is, which is just as important, is when you press the trigger first of all, what you can get is dry tip, which is a build up of paint on your needle from where you've been using it. We'll get into dry tip later on, but what ends up happening is the first time you press that trigger, it will, because you've got dried built up paint on the needle, it will splatter all of that paint. So by starting off of the model, what that means is, is when you get that splatter, it's going to happen on your glove and not the model and you're not going to ruin your work. Now you can see on screen, I'm mixing up the next paint. This is Vallejo Game Air Magic Blue. And I just did this so I could show you the ratio for the paint, flow improver and the water. So you can see that basically I've got roughly equal measurements for all three. And again, this is, this is my general ratio what you'll find is is as you start experimenting with other paints you probably will need to adjust this depending on the color and the brand and that sort of stuff but this is what i generally use i use a very thin paint and build it up very slowly so we're going to start painting the blade was base coated black and then i did a thin coat of vallejo model air blue over the whole thing to give it that very dark blue tone the next thing that we're going to be doing is that Vallejo Game Air Magic Blue, which you saw me mix up. We're going to be spraying that, spraying that onto the blade. Now, you can see the bubbles coming out of my airbrush. Again, I haven't looked after this airbrush right now. It needs a desperate clean. And the point of that, like I said at the beginning, is I wanted to show that you didn't need to have amazing equipment and you don't necessarily need to be very experienced to be able to do this. Now, what's important here is you can see at this point, I have more paint on my glove than I do on the blade. This is because I've locked my trigger position in place, spray off the model, and then I move my airbrush so it sprays onto the model. And then I move the airbrush so it finishes off the model. This is so incredibly important, especially when you're not necessarily very experienced and you don't have great trigger control. You start your spray on your hand, on your glove, Lock your trigger position in place when you're at a point where your spray is okay, so you're not spraying out loads of paint or there's loads of pressure. And then you move the airbrush across your model. So you start off your model and then you finish off your model. You build up multiple really, really thin coats. So the idea is, is by doing the multiple thin coats, like very, very slowly, it will give you a very soft transition. So this is all about control. And if you just spray on that airbrush on that model, your chances are you're not going to have control. You're going to splatter paint everywhere. So do it off the model, get it into the position that you like, and then happy days. When you're more experienced, you'll probably just be able to get your trigger lock in, your trigger control perfect, and you'll know exactly how much pressure to press to to put on the trigger to get a perfect result and you won't need to worry about this so much 
This is definitely something that you want to be doing at the beginning. The next thing that we need to talk about with this particular blade is the angle in which you're spraying the model at. So I do feel like it's better to explain this on here rather than just as a voiceover on the video because it's not always easy to, to understand what I'm talking about um, and it doesn't come across very clear so I figured I'd show you. So if we were looking at this blade from the end, this is basically the shape that you would have. You would have these two areas here are the flats of the blade. These are the, this is, these two are the sides of the blade and this is the flat rear section of the blade. Now, the main reason I'm bringing this up is because the angle in which that we spray is really important. So if we were to spray directly down as an example, so if we had our airbrush coming from up here, we sprayed directly down, what's gonna happen is, is the paint's gonna go on this surface here and then it's going to go in exactly the same place this here. We don't really want that because we want our highlight positions to alternate, which I'll explain in a second when we get back to the video. So the angle we choose to spray the blade at is incredibly important. So if we're trying to spray the flat of the blade, ideally what we want to do is we want our airbrush spray spraying at kind of this angle. So the reason for that is, is because when the paint hits the flat of the blade, it won't hit this side of the blade and it won't hit the other side of the flat of the blade. So this sort of angle is going to give us the most control on where the paint goes. It's the same as the side of the blade. What we actually want to do is we want the paint to come down at this kind of angle because then what's going to happen is the paint is going to come down. It's going to hit all of this, but it's not going to hit this. Or rather, it's, it's not going to get there's, there's not a lot of paint that's going to hit. We're going to get very little overspray. So that's the important part of it. We just need to make sure that the angles are right so we don't get overspray on the rest of the blade itself. And that's how we get that nice jump between the really dark blue, in this case, to the really light blue. So be very picky about the angle that you're spraying your airbrush to the blade. So, and the other thing is, what you need to remember is don't adjust your airbrush position too much, adjust the model itself, all right? It's easier to move the model and be comfortable than it is to move the airbrush and be comfortable. Next up, we're going to a brighter paint. Any kind of sky blue color will work here. I've just added white to the magic blue because I don't have a brighter blue. Again, same mix as previous, you can see me mixing you can see me spraying the paint on my glove this is me testing out to see how that paint's going to come out i'm starting you can see the paint hitting my glove behind that blade right now i'm spraying on my glove and then i'm very very slowly moving it to the edge of the blade the whole unless you've got incredible airbrush skill like airbrush control you will not be able to spray with the whole of with the whole of the spray cone coming from that airbrush onto this blade and get a perfect shape start on the glove and slowly keep moving airbrush onto the blade itself till you gradually build up to a color that you like what you'll find is it will just be the edge of where you're spraying that will hit the blade to tint it. You'll probably find that you'll waste loads of paint on your glove. That is absolutely fine. Remember, you haven't got great trigger control and you're not gonna have great trigger control at the beginning and some people never do. There's nothing wrong with that. It's about working out and finding ways where you can get around that. This is a very handy trick and it worked for me for a long time and I still do use it sometimes if I'm doing something very precise. But there you can see it. We've got the blade, the dark and the light alternating. So we've got a light spot at the top and the bottom of the flat of the blade. And then on the side of the blade, we've got that one bright spot. That's as much as I'm doing for now. That's all we need to do. If you're feeling confident, you can go even brighter with a white. That's entirely up to you. Now you can see me spraying on my glove right now. So before we go on to adding in the brush parts to finish up the blade, I wanted to demonstrate what I'm looking for when I'm spraying on my blade, now on my glove. Now ideally there is a sweet spot when it comes to paint hitting your model. And it's between 
that big puddle that you can just see that I made and those four marks that I've just made. And what happens is you can see on screen right now, you can see how that paint is quite shiny and wet on that last dot that I did. That is your warning point. So what happens is, is as you build paint up on your model, the paint will start by looking very dry and dusty. And then what will happen is, is that paint will start getting wetter and wetter. And when it starts getting wet, that's your warning point. That's the sweet spot. Because after that wet point, it will start pushing the paint around and making little puddles and coffee stains um, and webbing, which is not what you want. So this is what I'm trying to demonstrate here. The idea is, is you want to keep your paint when you're airbrushing, it kind of wants to look dry. As soon as it starts looking wet, you stop airbrushing. So and I'm demonstrating this here on this little piece of plastic. You can see me building up. Keep going back to it. I'm putting a small amount of paint on until it builds up color. And then I'm stopping at a point where it's starting to look wet. As soon as you start seeing it looking glossy, you stop airbrushing because it needs time to dry. And that is how a lot of people get into problems with, with webbing and puddles and that sort of stuff, which is not what you want. So you want to build it up very slowly. Now you can see here how wet that paint is. That is your warning point. As soon as you see your paint wet like that stop stop spraying on the model because that is the point where that's going to happen that's the point where it's going to start pushing that paint around it's going to leave a big clear transparent patch in the middle with a massive dirty water paint mark around the edge or even worse as you can see on that last one it's going to leave these web marks that come off of it as soon as your paint looks wet i can't stress this enough stop airbrushing all right and what i would suggest you do is practice on a piece of plastic if you get that locking in point for your trigger in place spray very slowly and what you'll see is when you first start your paint will almost look like it's dry instantly while you're spraying and as you build up more and more layers sorry as you as you keep going what's going to happen is that paint will get wetter and wetter and then it will break and it will splatter and that's not what you want the next thing that i wanted to explain is you need to the reason why we start one of the reasons why we start off the model other than control and finish off the model as well is because of this basically what happens is is where you start spraying it leaves more paint and where you end spraying it leaves more paint as well and we really don't want that so by starting off the model and ending off the model we don't have those two stronger paint marks at the end. All we have is that 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 um, consistent or rather more consistent amount of paint. And we don't have those big marks at the end. So it's also it's not just about trigger control. Um, it's not just about testing it. It's also about getting consistent brush marks on the actual model as well. So that's one of the reasons why we start off the model. We and we end off the model as well. Next up, considering this video is all about control, gaining as much control as possible with as little experience as possible, the next thing that we need to think about is locking our wrist. You watch when I'm airbrushing, sorry, a lock in our hands. When I'm airbrushing right now on my glove, I'm not moving my hand. It's my whole arm that is moving right now. This is really important because what happens is you lock your hand in place. Remember, we want to lock our trigger finger. We lock the whole of our hand and only move our arm. And what happens is, is there's less chance of us losing our lock position for our trigger. And this is about making up for the fact that we probably don't have amazing trigger control. Not everyone's got the control of the likes of Sergio. So this is the way that we can balance it as a beginner. Lock your hand in place your trigger finger in place and then move the whole of your arm. If you move your hand like I just have, what happens is as you move your hand, you also move your fingers. You move your fingers, you lose that lock position and then you lose your control over your airbrush trigger and then you start getting inconsistent marks and you make mistakes. Next up, we talked about dry tip earlier or very briefly I mentioned it. Dry tip ultimately is what happens 
as you airbrush. There's nothing that can be done about it as far as I've ever found. Now, you can see this really well on this airbrush. There's obviously loads of old red paint all over the airbrush. That's not from what we've been doing. But you can see around the needle is that big blob of blue paint. This is really important. This is going to happen regardless of what you're doing. Ultimately, you are blowing paint and air through a tiny hole. What's happening is, as you're doing that, some of that paint is drying. There's nothing that can be done about it. Now, the issue that this has is this dry tip will, firstly, it will block your airbrush if it builds up too much. And if your airbrush starts to block, the nice cone spray that you get that comes out of your airbrush will no longer be a cone. It will change shape or it will go off to one side and then it will cause it to splatter and you won't get nice transitions. So what you need to do is periodically clean your airbrush. Now for me, because of the way that I thin the paint, I don't really need to do a proper clean. Like I don't need to run airbrush cleaner through it or anything like that. All I do is get a little bit of kitchen roll and I wipe it every so often. So basically, after maybe 30 seconds to a minute of spraying, see that I've just pulled the needle out and I'm just showing you the, the, the paint that's built up on the needle. Um, but after 30 seconds of a, or a minute of spraying, I'll get some kitchen roll and I'll just wipe that dry tip off because it's not going to be very strong on there. And then that'll solve the problem. And then you just make sure you clean your airbrush at the end. The other problem is, is as you spray, What's going to happen when you start a spray? Sometimes that dry tip is going to splatter off and you're going to get big clumps of thick paint, which will splatter all over your model, which is what you don't want as well. Dry tip is something to keep in mind all the time. It's a very good habit to actively keep an eye on your airbrush for dry tip and clean it every so often. As I said, I only use kitchen roll. That's always done. That's always worked for me. Something to think about that might be different based on the paints that you are actually using. Dry tip might build up a lot more if you're using thicker paints. For example, if I use Vallejo model color through the airbrush, no matter how much I thin them, they do end up being quite, uh, they do end up drying quite quickly with big lumps of paint. So it's definitely something that you want to be thinking about. Now, the next step that we've got, as you can see, is we need to start actually making this blade readable we've got those nice transitions it's not perfect i can't stress that enough it's really not perfect like we've got a little bit of paint splatter in there but we're not really going to notice it at the end we need to start framing the shape of this blade that's one of the most important things now i've got two paints on the palette at the moment one of them's a air paint and one of them's vallejo model color the reason why I'm showing you this is you can see the airplane the paint is naturally very thin and the Vallejo model color is quite thick. Now, if you go with a paint that's very thin, you're going to make your edge highlighting very difficult because you want to catch an edge. You don't want it to flow around everywhere. Whereas in, if you go with a thicker paint, you can thin it until a point that you're happy with. So you can keep thinning it until it's opaque enough, but it's not going to flow everywhere. But if you use a very thin paint, it's already very thin you can't thicken it so potentially you're losing an element of control and edge highlighting you don't want your paint to flow like loads you want it to stay in the position that you are painting this paint is Vallejo model color sky blue and what I'm doing is is ultimately I'm edge highlighting the whole of this blade all the way around it really important with this it creates readability it means that we can understand and see the shapes that we're looking at it's the most important thing to do without that it looks very washed out now this paint worth noting this paint i'm matching the brightest paint that i have on the blade at the moment so we are going to go brighter we will need to go brighter now i'm going to say this particular blade i didn't really think about this is a gray knight's halberd i probably shouldn't have used one of these blades because the central line that goes down this halberd can't actually edge highlight because the angle is too soft so i've had to paint this line manually on as you can see rather than using the side of my blade side of my brush rather um, but it is what it is you've seen me do it so that's fine so this already changes things quite a lot it basically gives us clear definition and shape so what we're going to do now is we're just going to go brighter and brighter until the point that we're happy. 
that you can see I've added some white to this blue. This is Velo model color white and my paint is still fairly opaque when I test it on the palette like you can see I'm removing the excess from my brush so I don't want loads of paint on my brush and then I'm testing to see what's going to happen on my glove. Now if you look when I'm doing my edge highlight I'm not using the middle of the brush I'm using close towards the tip of the brush the reason for that is the tip is much smaller much easier to get a nice crisp line rather than using a massive fat area of the brush. The other thing that you'll notice, I'm not edge highlighting everywhere anymore. I'm only edge highlighting around the bright highlights that I've put in place with the with the actual airbrush. And you'll also notice, generally speaking, what I'm doing is I'm starting in the center of the airbrush highlight and my brush stroke goes out. And what I'm doing, if you look, I'm flicking my brush off of the actual model. So what that means is I'm pulling, as I'm doing my brush stroke away, I'm pulling the mop brush off as well. And this just gives it a nice gradient. We don't have a big stop mark like where we remove the brush. And the idea with this is, is we want to push the shine spot on these last little highlights. Now, ultimately you're not going to get away from edge highlighting with these blades because you can see already how much of a difference it makes. Now, if you are using these Grey Knight weapons, you're going to have a problem with this central line. It is very difficult to do, to paint very nice crisp lines, and there's a few bits where I make mistakes on it. So what I would suggest you do, you're trying to paint a nice crisp line. Do exactly what I said previously. Load your brush up, remove the excess on a piece of kitchen roll or your hand, and then twist your brush on your glove or your kitchen roll while you're removing it to restore the point and then practice your brush stroke on your hand first because remember if your brush stroke is going to be massive and you've got too much paint if you make that mistake off the model you're much better off lastly when you're doing your brush stroke always pull the brush towards your body so don't do it sideways or, or upwards or anything like that because when you pull the brush towards your body towards your wrist you'll have far more far more control and the other thing is, is you exhale as you do your brush stroke, it will help steady your hands. If you're anything like me, you've got, you'll have you you have shaky hands when you're trying to do something this small. So exhale as you do your brush stroke and it will help settle your hands and you'll get a nicer stroke. Now I'm not going to pretend that's easy because it's not, but it's the best explanation and the best tips that I can give you to help with that if you have to paint on the lines. So once again, we're going to go even brighter. Now you can see that this is mostly white now. We're not using pure white. I never want to use pure white until like, if I'm going to place like maybe a white dot or something like that. You can see that this is basically almost a white blue. This is almost pure white, but a tiny little bit of blue on it. When you put it, when I put it on my glove, it reads as white. So the last thing is we're going to put very, very small edge highlights. On this blade the smaller we put these highlights the shinier the blade is going to look if you make your highlights wider and give the impression that it's a much flatter not flatter it's a much less shiny surface you want to keep this very small now you can see the difference that's made already it's, it's this is a case of patience but once again I'm doing exactly the same thing I'm using towards the tip of my brush because that allows me to get a much smaller brush mark. If you use the middle of your brush, the belly of your brush, you're going to get a very fat mark. And you can see how I'm just almost like flicking my brush off the model. This gives me a nice gradient and it gives me a nice soft edge highlight as, as the, the white fades out. And this is where it starts to pop. Now, Again, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Edge highlights is something that I know not everyone is a fan of, but ultimately when they're relevant, they are incredibly important to do. And if you're going to do something like a shiny weapon or a crystal weapon or something like that, edge highlights have to be done. And remember as well, like I say this in a lot of my videos, readability is huge. When we're looking at something that's 28 mil scale, we need to be able to understand exactly what we are looking at when we're looking at it from far away. And if we don't have our shapes defined, everything kind of blurs together and it doesn't look as striking 
And this is why Games Workshop, especially traditional Games Workshop models, old school GW models, where they edge highlighted absolutely everything. That's where that's why they used to look so great. Because ultimately it comes down to the fact that it's, everything is just neatly painted, but everything is clearly readable as well. And that's incredibly important. Now you can see here, this is the same white blue that I mixed up a minute ago, but it's far more transparent. I'm going, I want this paint to be very thin because what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the bright spots on the blade itself. So this is probably four parts water to one part paint, but you want it transparent. Remove the excess paint from your brush. What I'm doing is I'm painting very small little lines and marks towards my brightest part of the blade. So in this case, the brightest part of my blade is towards that outer edge on this curve. The idea is that we're pushing the shine spot to almost a white with a very transparent paint. So it'll take a few brush marks, keep it small. Remember, this is the same as when we talked about the edge highlights. I want to keep it very, very small. The reason why I'm doing this with a brush is because if you're relatively new to airbrushing, Chances are you're not going to be airbrushing. You're not going to be able to airbrush uh, a really shiny, a really small white spot onto your blade. So the point with this is, is it's transparent paint build up very slowly in a tiny, tiny area. And all it takes is a few marks. And there you can see it there. Now, I quite like this blade. For me, it does look a little bit not boring, boring is not the right word, but maybe uninteresting. So what you can do is you can add some little scuffs and marks. Now the idea with this is, is if this blade is very shiny, what you can do is you can just add like edge highlights. Uh, you can add little lines for interest. And on the peaks of the blades, this is pure white. This is the Vallejo model color white. And I'm putting tiny little dots on the peaks. Now. I probably wouldn't do this because I think for me it's a little bit too extreme but that's purely a uh, that's purely a personal preference but it does make a difference it does make it much stronger for me it's a little bit too much but I wanted to show it because I do think it's it's worth doing and I know a lot of people like putting white dots all over everything so you can make your choice you've seen it before and you've seen it after but this is where we're gonna add some interest so that previously really bright blue that we had on the edges of the blade, I've put lots of little dots. These are like little shine spots, which show maybe imperfections on the blade. And I'm going to do a couple of scratch marks down the blade. Now, how realistic this sort of stuff is, is entirely up to you. I prefer something a little bit more gritty, but again, this keeps in tone with, with what we're trying to achieve. So same advice as when we were doing that line that goes down the center of the blade which separates the, the side of the blade and the actual edge of the blade. Remove the excess paint from your brush, test your brush stroke off the model, and then exhale as you do your brush stroke for some nice little scratches. But again, you've seen it before and you've seen it after, it's up to you whether you like it or not. And that's it, that's the blade as you can see on screen. As always, I hope this has been helpful. Let me know what your thoughts are. If you've got any feedback about the, about the video, how well was everything explained? I'm always looking to improve this stuff, guys. So please do let me know. Once again, thank you everyone for supporting the channel. It means a huge amount. Feel free to hit the like button. I can't even tell you how much of a difference that makes. Um, and yeah, cheers. Thanks very much. And I'll, I'll catch you all later.